Welcome, welcome everyone um, uh, to the second uh, uh, lecture in the series uh, titled Practices and Pedagogies, uh, organized by Projective Cities MPhil uh, here at the AA. Um, my name is Platon Isaias, um, and I'm the head of program, and I would like to thank also uh, the AA public program and everyone uh, that has supported, especially manager, this uh, uh, series that we are uh, doing in term two. Um, the talks, the six talks, uh, aim to discuss models uh, and forms of practice that intersect with architectural education, uh, old, new, and emerging pedagogical agendas. Um, today, we are really happy, excited, and honored to have with us uh, Alejandra Celedon, um, a really uh, good friend of the school and the program, um, and who is also uh, an alumna of uh, the AA. Um, her lecture today uh, is titled Objects of Narrative uh, Impulse. Um, I'm not going to say much about, I, I think it's so fascinating, I'm just going to leave it for her to, to walk us through this incredibly fascinating theme. Uh, I'm just going to say a few words about uh, her. Uh, Alejandra is an architect uh, from Chile. Uh, she has an MSc in Advanced Architectural Studies from the Bartlett, uh, awarded in 2007, and a PhD from uh, the Architectural Association. Uh, from 2014. Uh, she has been the curator of Stadium, uh, the Chilean pavilion at the 16th Venice Architecture Biennale 2018, and the co-curator of the plot, Miracle and Mirage, at the Third Chicago Architecture Biennial uh, in 2019. Her later publications include the book Stadium, uh, a building to render the image of a city from 2018, and the essays, the Chilean school, a room for a printing and uprising, at the AA Files 2020, and the plot Miracle and Miraz uh, in Vera Vista from 2021. Uh, she's head master in architectural program at the School of Architecture in the Pontifical University of Catholica de Chile. Um, and I think she's connecting from there this morning uh, in a bright summer, sunny day, no? <laughs> uh, Alejandra, welcome back. We are so happy to have you with us. Thank you, Platon. It's great to be back, even if it is by Zoom. Uh, thanks, Ahmed and Platon, for the invitation. And it's also great to be part of, of this series of great colleagues and friends. It's an honor to be next to their names. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm going to share the screen uh, if I find it. Yes, yeah. Is it okay, Platon? Great. Um, so a photograph and a drawing are the objects of this lecture. Uh, and both the title and the election of an image on the one hand and a plan on the other uh, attempt to exemplify uh, in relation to, to, to the invitation of the program there, uh, a mode of practice, but also a pedagogy that develops from these objects, uh, somehow following Jing's work and the micro history, and also a focus on the archival documents to unravel larger stories, and also something that uh, perhaps connects these two objects that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, it's also like somehow a collective way of working. Uh, the first one uh, was developed uh, as a master thesis within a studio. Uh, and the second was also part of, a, of an undergrad uh, studio within the school. So the photograph depicts the interior of a dismantled bus employed as classroom in Nueva La Habana in the periphery of Santiago, Chile. This was an unprecedented educational and social experiment that transformed the outskirts of Santiago into an open school within a few years at the beginning of the 70s. The photograph became the object of an essay well, that was published in 2020 in the uh, architectural research magazine, The Lines Notes on Politics, edited by Marina Laturi. And the drawing on the right is a plan of a building, Chile National Stadium, prepared for an event in 1979, when property titles were delivered to settlers. This floor plan became the centerpiece of the Chilean pavilion in the 16th Venice Biennale in 2018, a drawing that records a brief moment in which a building renders the image of a city. Object words and discourses drive an intertwined narrative in two different modes of the re register, 
an image that end up in an essay and a drawing that end up in an exhibition. The 100 buses no longer in use were employed as classrooms in a Spanish aula at the beginning of the 70s, capturing interest both locally and abroad. Nueva La Habana, one of the 22 shanty towns that employ the buses, received many visitors from university students to educators, politicians, photographers, and filmmakers. This, the experiment then captures a moment in Chilean history that triggered a critical view of the educational system and at the same time brought forth new questions on the status of the classroom as the ultimate building block of the school, both as an institution and building. The bus aula dissolved the boundary of the educational facility, blending it into the streets of Santiago, peripheral neighborhoods, and between the bus aulas, the city itself became a school and the precarious infrastructures created a sense of possibility this was an urgent program carried by the state um, through an, an institution that operated in Chile from 1937 until its dissolution uh, five decades later in 1987, along with the eventual dismantling of public education in Chile by the military regime. The buses became the solution to face the educational deficits and sometimes total lack of any educational facility in the new informal settlements organized by the state as a housing solution. The experience embodied a specific social reality of their time and place, autonomous schools for temporary housing in times of economic scarcity and political optimism. The converted buses became one of the most radical education interventions in the history of the country. After taking root in a specific place, the buses became one star in a constellation that articulated political and social forces, triggering larger systemic shifts in the community. The school extended lines in the territory, diluting the physical and temporal limits of their teaching. The ready-made classrooms, even one as precarious as a dismantled bus, became a device capable of irrigating an urban and social system surpassing expectations as an atomized school and becoming a part of the social infrastructure. The history of the bus aula demonstrates the relevance of a classroom as a space of activation with a neighborhood and these imaginary lines that were created that can be traced further from this photograph. So Nueva La Habana uh, was a población or a shanty town. Uh, founded on November 1970 as part of the Unidad Popular political project, and it was renamed as Nuevo Amanecer, New Dawn, after the coup in 1973, as many other popular neighborhoods uh, did. Was made up uh, the neighborhood by uh, of a group of about 2,500 families, approximately 9,000 residents, who were transferred from three different land takeovers into this new site. Um, and there were many people involved in the creation of the CAM, including the Corporación de la Vivienda, Housing Corporation, professionals, students from Universidad de Chile and Universidad Católica, and leaders of the CAM's residents who were fundamental supporters in the beginning of the transformative path from temporary solutions into permanent housing. The Movimiento de Izquierda Revolucionaria, Revolutionary Left Movement, had an important presence and influence with a high degree of organization and self-management capacities among the residents and visitors. So as, as I said before, Nueva La Habana attracted international attention as many other aspects of the local period in Chile did. Uh, the neighborhood was frequently visited, photographed and filmed, teachers, students, political party militants and residents were continually assisted and interviewed by various groups of, of uh, study groups and local press. Uh, but amid the tensions of the Cold War, it also attention came from countries as distant as France and Russia. Uh, and several documentaries were made uh, about the camp at the time and even attracted the interest of the French philosopher Henri Lefebvre. Uh, this number of Espace et Société, the interdisciplinary scientific journal of geography, architecture, and town planning founded by Lefebvre, dedicated its publication in April 1975, entitled Representations of the City to an article about Nueva La Habana, 
Uh, the vast aula became a case study in which the social appropriation of the process in the production of the city developed along the materializing of political ideas, confirming the city as a necessary space to produce concrete utopias. Um, the, the work with the residents uh, produced a diagrammatic internal organization aimed at strengthening the residents to overcome urban struggles and, the, and developing a revolutionary, but above all, collective consciousness. The local historian Boris Cofre described the experience led by the residents in Nueva La Habana, the pobladores, as revolutionary politicization, the process by which problems that were previously perceived and solved individually uh, from 1970 began to be faced collectively, and as a result impacted the consciousness, identities, relationships, ways of life, and types of, of organization in the community until, until broken up by the coup that in 1973. So the anonymous photograph of the bus transforming to a classroom crystallizes that process at a time when the school was transformed into a series of classrooms scattered through the city's outskirts registering the intensity and coincidence between the social, political, and the uh, educational explorations. The pedagogical environment installed in the commission buses became a place where the school and the city merged as part of the same problem and solution. So the project addressed the educational needs of the new shanty towns emerging in the city as pilot camps, 254 buses, out of circulation and abandoned in a parking lot uh, that, that had been totally discarded until the state foresaw their potential. Once refurbished, they were used as trampled stable classroom into various of these camp encampments on the outskirts, receiving about 20,000 children daily. Uh, one of the documentaries uh, described the experience as a response, uh, as this is, was quite common in Chilean history, engendered from urgency and scarcity, but then the Basaula synthesizes a specific social reality of a place and time, mainly a do-it-yourself mentality and a sense of close community typical of self-organization. Uh, the state in those years had been working with systematized buildings, both at the level of design and construction process. They had implemented prefabricated system to allow for easy transportation, uh, to extend educational facilities across the uh, whole national territory. And the best example of a, of a classroom uh, building system developed at the time uh, was a system that it's a drawing of, uh, above named MC606, also called the stamp plan, as was distributed throughout the country. And it consisted on an, of an ordinary single roof, a single floor prefabricated steel structure with a gable roof that in terms of size and simplicity, didn't differ much from the space of a bus. Uh, however, they were really radically different in terms of the definition of its borders. The MC606 above uh, were composed on a site as a series of classrooms uh, along a corridor next to a pavilion building. The bus aulas operated instead as autonomous pieces of furniture without attachment to any building, they, and they used the city as their edifice. Uh, along with the arrival of the 11 buses that came to Nueva La Habana, an important self-governance system was being instituted around an ideal of community life. The organization consisted of a president, seven leaders, a board of directors, and the work front or commandos comunales, coordinating committees for health, surveillance, workers, supplies, education, and even justice. Uh, this successful self-management strategy allowed the camp to take shape and to gradually take on other demands related to quality of life and ideas beyond housing. And the vast aulas were part of those functions. They became a piece of activism within the community capable of articulating political and social forces, including the city in the process. For instance, near the buses in Nueva La Habana, there was a small booth for the person in charge of the school sector. One of the buses became a library. Uh, there was an existing cancha that it's an open space that become the school sport field and the cultural space that was already in the middle of the neighborhood acted as a stage for public events. So beyond adapted machines, the buses managed to trigger a larger territorial system of social relations. As the school spread in the territory, it also diluted the physical and temporal limits of its teaching. Such emergency strategy inevitably carried out an ideological tactic, in this case, led by the um, 
mean movimiento de izquierda revolucionario that can be seen as a laboratory of a collective life where those involved were also gaining agency over their own destiny. So such new political consciousness and sense of collectivity was promoted and even educated from the government to the people. These comics here, uh, for example, are part of this effort in which an entire cartoon uh, publicated in the, in the local publishing house uh, was dedicated to communicating and explaining the past aula to the community. Uh, the Brazilian educator Paulo Freire visited Chile twice during the Unidad Popular, uh, interest in the concrete ideas of the class struggle as expressed in varied forms. He dwelt into the work of mobilization and pedagogical politicization organization developed here, uh, specifically in Nueva La Habana. So the teaching style developed uh, in a diluted hierarchy between teachers and parents. Uh, one of the popular forms of distributing power which developed in the camp at that time uh, when the traditional school family separation found new definitions, teaching content was decided jointly between parents, representatives of the blocks and the teachers who ensured the minimum teaching requirements to the Ministry of Education. But children instead here were taught the history of miners, peasants and settlers in Chile, the concept of, of class struggle and the idea of popular power. Uh, some, well, and also the, at night, the buses also receive adults in charge of the literacy commission. Uh, some universities, uh, students uh, lived for a period of the time, and some teachers of the bus aulas came moved to live in the población. And the bus aula and the problem education open up to the city fabric a position itself as the building block for educational system. This was not the case for the most conventional construction of modular school buildings as defined by the state in the previous year. So this is a school, neither a building nor an institution. Uh, so the school in Nueva La Habana born out of these 11 classrooms as in buses and the need for culture within a community that generating something different, something new, uh, together with the support network and the need to appropriate other spaces in the camp, the buses cause disengagement of the system that traditionally make up school, disrupting uh, the concept of education and architecture. The explosion of the basis, basic pieces of a school cause a piece of the city to become a school, generating a new ideal of pedagogy without physical and formal limits in an expanded education with greater scope. So the buses had an impact as soon as they arrived, they generated a new layout, producing different movement patterns are creating new invisible lines within the space of the neighborhoods. The boundaries between the school and the camp gradually started to dissolve, forming a new territorial order around education. Uh, and of course, that as the buses provided the minimal means possible for an educational facility, the rest of the functional spaces that a school would normally need had to be met in the camp itself. Um, as I have said before, one was the library, uh, other was the, the, the sport fields, and the whole neighborhood became the school. And it was not only the idea of a school building that was put into crisis, but also it seemed much as an institution. So the bus changed its role by being installed as an herbal building within the camp becoming activators in the community. The school occupied a central place in the popular and political and social movements, part of a self-organized project promoted by its own inhabitants that became one of the most radical examples of political autonomy of its time. After the um, 1973 coup, the panorama in the camp changed radically, as in many other towns. The camp was raided on the same day, September 11, and its name changed to New Dawn. Uh, the riots resulted in the arrest of the leader, the resistance of its inhabitants, and the repression of the state apparatus. And when school life came back weeks after the coup, the school sector had appointed a new director. Since then, the militant dressing of the revolutionary left movement had to go underground. And some teachers disappeared the following days, or they went to exile abroad over the course of the weeks and months, and others were relocated to other schools and didn't return either. During 1974, new students arrived, and the buses were gradually replaced by regular classrooms made of light construction. 
And by, by 1977, uh, the privatization of the housing formula meant, in part, the dismemberment of the camp. Some of the lots and sites were handed into the military. However, over the years and well into the 80s, the school remained as a place where such social and political difference would still disappear for the children, as one uh, ex-alumni explains. Um, by the time of this essay was published on November 2020, Nueva La Habana celebrated its 50th anniversary of its establishment. The vast aula at the core of the Neighborhood Foundation was a policy and an emergency solution, but it above all became an experiment which replicated throughout the periphery of Santiago, as this map shows, irrigating the urban landscape and transformed for a few years the idea of a school building in as a series of atomized classrooms into a network of social infrastructure. So these are uh, screenshots from uh, one of the documentaries. There are many. Uh, and some of the uh, press uh, information at the time. Uh, it was also, I'm, I'm not completely sure by the time of this research, uh, but there was the intention of build uh, or put one of these buses in Plaza de la Constitución, like, which is the square in front of the government palace, uh, exemplifying again this tension between uh, the center and the periphery of the city uh, in terms of policies. So the second object narrative that I'm presenting today is not an image, but a drawing, not any drawing, but a drawing of a plan. And a stadium was the pavilion that represented Chile at the 16th Venice Biennale in 2018. Free space, it was commissioned by the Ministry of Culture here in Chile. And a year later, and with the same support, it was adapted to be exhibited at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Santiago. And the main operation there was to compress a large building, the National Stadium, into an exhibition space. And it's important to stop here with when we make this shift uh, from the first object to the second one. Uh, that between the two, actually, there is a decade span, uh, and they stand for very different uh, housing policies uh, and also they represent in terms of uh, research and developing a, a, a story from certain objects uh, the fact that one is an image from the interior of a bus in the interior of an incumbent and the other one is a top-down view of a drawing a uh, very technical and and it also tells a lot about the two stories um so as a result of conversations with settlers about the origin of their houses and sites is that this drawing appeared from the hands of one of them. It was an unscaled plan of the Chile National Stadium that instead of bleachers and seat, enclosed in more than 60 polygons and boxes the names of different towns and villages of the 17 communes that made up the periphery of Greater Santiago at the time. And this drawing was prepared for an event uh, on the 29th, 29th of September of 1979, in which the stadium was filled with people from all over the city, uh, from all over the outskirts of the city. And the focus of this gathering was not a sporting contest nor a concert, but a massive bureaucratic operation in which 37 Southern property titles were handed to dwellers, processed in a single day, in an attempt uh, to resolve decades of makeshift land occupations and uh, improvised policies. Uh, yes, so a drawing uh, that was intriguing enough, a plan for an event that superimposed uh, somehow a cartographic and a narrative impulse in the same gesture. The, the plan arrested distant populations in the oval shape of the building in a synoptic and panoramic effort. The stadium blueprint was rendering visible the city uh, marginalized on its edges. And the audience, the audience of this event was mostly receivers of another public policy previous, uh, were, were receivers of Operación Cito, Operation Site. There was a 1960s a national self-help housing initiative that responded to Chile's severe housing crisis by giving people access to a private plot uh, within the city. So to its critic, it was referred to Operación Tiza, Operation Choc, 
since the top tracing of a semi-urbanized nine by eight meters plot was what most people received, uh, in other words, bare earth. And to be able to call a piece of the city their own, however distant from its center, dwellers then had to demonstrate financial savings over several installments before they would be advanced onto another list, this time not for a piece of land, since they were already occupying it for decades, but a piece of paper with a property title inscribed upon it. So the exhibition develops from this drawing of a relatively unknown history of the stadium, or rather the stories that a monument never entirely reveals, but even sometimes conceals. This event held during the, the military dictatorship announced a new housing policy uh, that could transform the nature of social housing from a right to a commodity that could be traded dependent on the saving capacities of potential owners. Henceforth, it would be the market from then onwards, subsidiary and not the welfare state, who would regulate from the cost of the land to the construction. Uh, the event also announced the creation of a new urban subject, um, as you can read in those titles if you can read Spanish, but it's like from, uh, from dweller or poblador to owner, and by the same currency, debtor. So what crystallized that day when granting debt instruments with a specific spatial coordinate was to fix a plan of the city that actually had no plan, uh, reinforcing the historic urban segregation of Santiago. And a, a, the privatized city was paradoxically celebrated in one of the most public buildings of Santiago. The official press at the time uh, announced the delivery of 160,000 property titles throughout the whole country in, the, in other stadiums and amphitheaters before the turn of the decade. And this involved in the same operation about 1 million citizens, but in a country of only 11 million inhabitants. So the architecture of the paradox is what the stadium exhibits. And weeks before the event, uh, the Ministry of Housing published a booklet in the official press, along with this blueprint of the stadium. This was 60 pages containing this long list of summoned people divided in the 17 communes of Greater Santiago, and then in which more than 60 assorted slums were represented through various shanty towns and the neighborhoods. Each commune was then assigned a specific sector within the stadium and a precise access door in the stand, which in effect created a complete grammar and aesthetic code connecting the building with the surrounding city uh, crystallized in that drawing. So the names were listed in alphabetical order, uh, were specialized in the plan, in the perimeters and containers of these different sizes and shapes, controlled within the building, but administered by a city. Uh, such a scale of appropriation could only be achieved through this country's military regime. And even if the event itself uh, was presented as a celebration of government propaganda and the reinforcement of a new popular capitalist doctrine, namely one whereby everyone in its urbanized society should have the opportunity to own property and shares in private companies. So the stadium in this sense was transformed into a panopticon, and like any panopticon, it operates as a symmetrical viewing machine whose center has to be occupied by an observer. In the stadium, or in our stadium specific history, a role taken on by figures of power from Fidel to the Pope. So it was the Renaissance humanist architect Leon Battista Alberti family that famously suggested that a city is nothing more than a large house and a house nothing more than a small city. So the same analogy acquires a new literal meaning with the stadium, extending Alberti's maximum activitas maxima domus, domus minima activitas, into a political process that by formalizing a model of administration of a building became a diagram for the larger city. So indeed for that day only, the logic of Santiago's urban plan was reflected in the logic of a stadium. Um, so the city's inhabitants uh, were transport in public buses from the neighborhoods directly into the stadium. 
And these people, by the end of the day, had become owners and by the same token debtors. And between musical shows and speeches, politics were being transformed into proprietors. An event of this scale demanded a huge amount of organization. In fact, it's meant to be the largest juridical and administrative operation in Chile's history. And this is like the second page of the booklet published in tandem with the event and where new rhetoric towards social housing uh, was announced in the tone of a manifesto. It says, uh, translating, the efforts of the state will be oriented towards facilitating for a family permanent ownership of a housing solution within their reach, compatible with their possibilities and satisfying a natural journey from home ownership was inscribed in these bold capital letters on the second page of the booklet. So in the same spirit, housing was defined further as uh, a good that it's acquired through the family's effort and savings. This effort is recognized and shared by the state. That is the ownership of a house is no longer right by a commodity. And through various subsidies, the state focus soon shifted from building towards overseeing the private development of individual plots. So from the original plan that circulated in the official press, uh, a new diagram was redrawn, composed by the urban palimpsest of this disintegrated island coming from the periphery of the city. Many were originally taken land, uh, regularized by the operation site, and now by this tabula rasa of home ownership. Uh, so the exhibition invites to imagine that is 40,000 square meters of the stadium. Uh, the city of Santiago is represented uh, by these 40,000 signatories that day. And very short, but also the exhibition uh, stopped and dwelt on the stadium itself and its history. By the opening of the Coliseum, it was the largest building of the capital, a tool of symbol and of modernization, which promoted sport as a model of an ideal citizen's body. Um, but only three years later will be the device of another type of indoctrination. It stands would witness the massive administration of the Catholic sacrament of First Communion to almost 100,000 children. It will also be the recurrent political tribune building. The president of the Republic used the national stadium to, as an instrument to address the country uh, from its construction to the breakdown of democracy. Uh, when it was used as a detention, torture, and extermination center, the largest prison camp operated by the regime. And after 17 years of the dictatorship, the return to democracy was celebrated in the same building, displaying this Chilean flag through the central arena. So the pavilion unpacks the, this critical reconstruction of the stadium's floor plan as an archipelago of urban islands, recreating, revisiting, and actualizing that historical plan. Uh, its central piece uh, extrudes this plan. He articulates all the three moments, uh, the event room in number one, uh, devoted to their Calval findings, part of the pavilion research. Um, the wall of the building horizon in number two, that is dedicated to celebrate the condition of a multiple building, the stadium's many fold stadiums. Uh, and the wall of the city uh, on number three uh, accounts for the distance, no, mm, yes, number four, <laughs> uh, that accounts for the distance between the stadium and the shanty town, how far they were apart, uh, amplifying also in number three, some personal narratives of these fragments represented. So the exhibition attempt to narrate a two-fold story interweaved by one drawing, that of a building, with its dissimilar and even contradictory past uses, uh, and that of a city with its atomized housing underpinning and unequal development, uh, both are laid in this single event. And these are images of the pavilion in Belize, uh, in which the main curatorial strategy was to build a stadium made of earth, uh, in which each one of the towns and villages were extruded at variable heights between 10 and 30 layers of rent earth, where well, the last layer is stamped with the urban fabric of the piece of the city in it individualizes, and these are other images. I'm not going to show the video. <laughs> um, and 
Yes, the, this engraving of Piranesi's Campo Marcio was a key piece for the curatorial proposal. Uh, somehow because of the sign of a crisis of sense between parts, uh, because the image of that, the, our original drawing, uh, what renders is not only that of an exiled or invisible city, but at once composed of island, an archipelago of towns and villages lacking of a city project, uh, containing the fragments of an unplanned and unrepresented city, analogous to Piranesi's task of reconstructing for Maurvis Romain. So the conceptual foundation of the pavilion was this retrospective construction of an image of the city composed in a piecemeal fashion, all intelligible through history and memory. So if Piranesi inscribed the city in, a, in, in, in an engraving in Campo Marcio, we need to compress a whole stadium and a city into a gallery. Um, and these are other images of our own little pieces. Um, and of course, at the stadium, it hasn't been the first time that it has been used as an underlying principle for both architecture and the city, establishing a reciprocity without a scale within, between the two, the part of the whole, the singular and the collective, the generic and the specific. And it's important here to say that the word stadium in English derived from Greek, uh, Platon Karnaitz, correct me, stadion, whose literal origin is, is a measure of distance. It doesn't refer to the arena, but it's actually the first test of the Olympic Games in Greece. Um, so it was about an eighth of a Roman mile, a little over of 600 feet or around 183 meters. And as an echo of this etymology, the, the pavilion also become its own measure of distance between the center and the periphery of a city, but between the past of a city and, the, and its present. Uh, and this particular past is historical an event that for one brief moment rendered an entire city within a building. And this was the second version here in Santiago, uh, in which it was a very different gallery. Um, he was in the, in the Museum of Contemporary Art, and in which the circular rhetoric of the typology of the stadium becomes at the same time metaphor and apparatus in its pretension to limit the city and organize it in this like new setting, which is also very axial and symmetrical. So the oval geometry ensures somehow that the fiction that knowledge and recognition are possible in that controlled world sample. I'm going to go fast. These are just images of the installation here and the way, way back. And between the two objects of today, there is a tension between, of course, the center and the periphery, but also uh, between different uh, approaches to housing policies. So both the buses and the stadium uh, became found objects somehow. Dislocated constructions serve for other purposes. Uh, buses employed a classroom, a sports stadium used as a management machine in the very same periphery of Santiago. So both displays from their original context and in this new site, either material or programmatic, uh, both were effective and instrumental to their objectives and as any designation and relocation of an object, um, it changed our perception or perception of its utility, its lifespan and also its status. And both uh, were indeed uh, adapted machines. Um, one that su was supposed to move was fixing the ground uh, to mobilize all the processes. The other one meant for celebrations and gathering became this administrative machine to transfer and channel people uh, into new subjectivities. And in different levels, the two narratives stand for this radically different housing policies with the time span of a few years. Uh, the photograph of the left, uh, taken again from inside of us, inside an encampment in the periphery of the city, depicts an emergency policy that operated through these discrete objects in a landscape. And the picture also stands for a territorial project imposed by the state, but developed with and by a social and political forces, self-empowered citizens, scattered through this bottom-up uh, maneuver. The stadium instead represents quite the opposite in many sense, a centralized project, exerted from the inner city towards the outskirts, top-down, 
a national policy delivered also by a limited military regime to administer and shape its citizens. Um, so somehow the rhetoric of an image of in, in the left and this potential of the plan uh, proved uh, on the drawing of the right uh, also marked the distance between the beginning and the end of a decade, that of the 70s in Chile. Again, 1971, the self-management empowered city residents deciding uh, that what they wanted uh, how they wanted to live, organize themselves, how they plan their neighborhoods, how to get educated, uh, what to teach in their classes, how to impart their own justice. And uh, in the other bottom in 1979, marked by this event in which people was brought, but not by force, but in buses into the stadium, telling them where to sit in the building and which coordinates to occupy in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think you have to, if you want to show these videos, you can sh show them now. I think we have plenty of have time. time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, what I, what I also wanted to mention was that uh, in terms of uh, modes of practice and pedagogies, uh, the fact of starting with these um, objects. Uh, it remind me while well, I put them together for this precise lecture, not before. Uh, that some there is something about like Walter Benjamin way of uh, when he speak about the work of art in the age of mechanical reproducibility. Uh, about the zoom in and zoom out when you see these two objects together. Uh, the one in the left, you are like the the surgeon or the cameraman that are inside. Actually, it's a photograph. And you have to dissect the object right inside the, uh, what happened there uh, as in opposition to the plan on the right in, in which you are the painter, you don't touch the object uh, or you are the, the magician without touching it. And this, this need of zoom in or zoom out in choosing your objects to actually unfold the story that uh, it was a last minute reflection. Uh, yeah, I'll go back. Perhaps I can show the two videos in the other order. So this is what was in the entrance of the Chilean pavilion, and it's the archival uh, research made for the for the pavilion. Uh, and there were like these three um, audiovisual projects. One was how the press at the time covered the event. And at the time in the middle of the dictatorship, you have like the official press and oppositional press. Uh, in the middle, uh, the national TV channel had to follow the, the dictator everywhere. So we found out the day of the event and it's registered. And then there's a one, another one on the right in which we wanted to individualize, individualize the names of each one of the presented here in the stadium. And actually it's a very recent history. So the people is many of them alive uh, and to give, a, like to give them a proper place and to realize the, the amount of the numbers uh, because this is one people signing from one side or from one plot. Uh, but actually in each one of these plots lived at least three families, so it's like 15 people for, per, per signature. Poco antes del mediodía llegó al Estadio Nacional el Presidente de la República acompañado por la Primera Dama de la Nación. Ministro de la Vivienda, General de Brigada Jaime Estrada y otras autoridades de esa Secretaría de Estado. El espectáculo en que participaron solistas y grupos folclóricos nacionales se detuvo mientras el mandatario y su esposa entregaban sus títulos a representantes de las comunas de Santiago. Se simbolizaba así una medida de hondo contenido social que beneficiará a más de un millón de chilenos postergados durante años de la posibilidad de ser dueños del sitio en que habitaban. Para llevar a cabo la iniciativa, el gobierno dictó el decreto ley número 2833 que facilitó los trámites de otorgamiento y de inscripción de los títulos. Con afecto, los pobladores agradecieron esa ayuda al presidente Pinochet. And it goes for uh, a, a lots of minutes. And actually in the page of the stadium, uh, which I'm going to paste in the chat, 
uh, you have the other uh, audiovisual projects uh, from the pavilion, actually the horizon, wait, I can't do it, uh, in which you can see all the, the other events that the stadium is able to narrate through their uses, through their occupations. Uh, and from Nueva La Habana, there's also like uh, some documentaries. I'm going to paste another one there that only start from minute 38. Uh, <clears throat> but it really captures lots of international attention. Um, actually, the photographs uh, of the woman, uh, it has its own story. I, di I didn't know if I had enough time, but it's, there's no certainty of who took the photograph. And there are like many versions that it could be a, a French photographer that spent many times in Nueva La Habana in those years that actually spent some time in a detention center and then went back. Uh, there was another Italian photographer that was following Fidel through Latin America. Um, so there's a whole enigma uh, about the, there were many people interested. There was some teacher from Universidad de Chile actually made the studio in Nueva La Habana and moved like a whole uh, group of students to live there for a week. Uh, students were helping the people to build their own houses. So it was a, a very particular moment in which, um, I guess in the two cases, there were, uh, registers. Uh, it's just the difference of, or the examples shown here is actually how other ways of telling the same story. It's not that there's an unknown finding. Uh, Great, perfect, thank you. Um, we can I think the ritual is we take some questions from the audience first, and then we ask. So, uh, Joaquin, do you want to ask something? That's why you. Uh, okay. Any questions? I think I think you need two minutes. Um, Amy. Hello. Hi, good Hi. afternoon, everyone. Hi, Alejandra. Uh, thanks a lot for the lecture. And um, I thought both um, topics were extremely fascinating. And I guess like my, the thing that I was thinking more about though was the first, uh, the concept of learning inside these buses, which become like dispatched uh, pieces of urban infrastructure, as opposed to being like in this uh, defined space. Uh, which is really fascinating, but I think what I started thinking more along the lines of was the unit level of the actual classroom and how like visually like that image that you showed us looks so much still like a traditional cl classroom as a like a in terms of like a spatial practice and protocol with the teacher at the front of the classroom with the blackboard behind her, all the students visible. Um, and so what I was thinking is like you have these other uh, kinds of teaching protocols, for example, in India, where I'm from, like sitting under a tree and learning outside if you don't have the space to provide uh, a classroom. So I guess I was wondering, like, to what extent do you think is like the role or the importance of spatializing a protocol to give it like some kind of gravitas or importance uh, as a precedent to study? Yeah, thank you, Amy. Um, yeah, I recently wrote this article for the AA files, and if you see images of a classroom from its, its institutionalization of the school till today, uh, there's no huge changes. Actually, it's uh, um, and what you meant, uh, the hierarchic position between a teacher and the children sitting and this, those bodies in, in passive attitude uh, and the role of furniture in actually modeling uh, or normalizing those behavior in children. Um, despite the fact that there have been or, or there are other tendencies and um, modes of teaching today, even Montessori and uh, I can't remember all the names from this moment, uh, and in, the, in which they work in groups or, or through projects collectively and not in this individual uh, chair for each children. 
Uh, it hasn't changed that much, and that's a, a fact. Uh, um, and I think, I guess that at least in this uh, story, the problem of the classroom is from the limit uh, of the classroom to the outside. Uh, how a school tradition has been built as a sum of classroom <clears throat> in a line with the surveillance of the corridor. And what happened with this very same traditional classroom is spread and exploded uh, into a neighborhood. But of course, there is a whole another story from the classroom to the inside, what happens inside. Um, and uh, there are many, even like the open school movement in which this classroom were open in the middle of uh, nature. And you have other, other explorations, uh, but I guess it's not the topic of this particular paper, but it's a whole world to, to study. And even if you study the, the, the norms of each country and you draw the norm, it's not very different from the UK to Chile or to anywhere. Um, yeah, it's it's a very good observation. Um, and also, well, there were the same state agency that worked in Chile from 37 to 87. Uh, it has a period between like 68 to 70 something in which they explore what happened if you uh, uh, make the, that classroom unstable, like more flexible and like uh, even in this not very rectangular elongated space that establish a hierarchy between the altar and <laughs> the other, uh, trying to see what happened. And then again, the question is how much influence has the architecture to shape the educational system back or if the educational system would shape another sort of space in response. Great. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? You, you in Do you want to ask something? You can unmute yourself. Great. Thank you for the fantastic lecture. Um, may I ask a question um, about that? Could you um, explain more about the bus classroom? Uh, because you mentioned that the bus classroom affects the whole neighborhood in the city outskirts and. Uh, um, yeah, can you explain more about that? Um, how those um, um, autonomous um, um, classrooms and uh, those things affect the whole neighborhood and in what relation that they can decide on how to live uh, in the city? Uh, yes, yeah. perhaps uh, I should have shown the, the video just to have an idea of how precarious this situation was. So, so like uh, earth in the streets, no uh, urbanization, like no proper urbanization. Some of these uh, shanty towns didn't have even like water. They have to walk kilometers to bring water to the, and they have like a, we call it whole toilets, but made up by the people in some corner of the neighborhood. So actually the whole neighborhood ha had to stood up to support these uh, buses. Uh, for instance, there was one uh, single street called La Hiera, <coughs> and that was the patio, the garden of the children, the same, uh, the same avenue <laughs> or street in which uh, people was working with horses and uh, I don't know, the, the big bottles of water. So everything was somehow mixed up. Uh, the only toilet from the whole area was the same toilet that the children had to walk for several minutes to go. It wasn't there in the whole, like, like uh, either block or uh, enclosed perimeter or, or the, the, um, the, the encampment. They had like a, in the central space, this uh, stage scenario. Uh, many people came to play from Victor Jara, uh, Iya, Punti Gimani, big, big, uh, very well-known uh, Chilean singers from the time. 
And that very same stage was used if they had like, a, let's say, a, they, they had organized a play, they would have to the same very stage that of the whole neighborhood, and that was the stage of the school. And many of these uh, places were first uh, either land takeovers or, or, or sessions or, or even expropriations, but that they were um, fundos. They were like agricultural fields, and many of them have a manor house. So that manor house was inhabitant, and every day or every two days, they were coming to the manor house with the children walking uh, as part of the history class, the class struggle of, and they have even like a, a water fountain there, and the children would. So actually, the whole very minimal and precarious infrastructure that the neighborhood had was also put into service, not only for education, like every was, everything was superposed. And um, this uh, dilution of limits between like teachers and parents also meant that some parents were helping at school, even if they weren't like uh, authorized uh, teachers. And um, they had like uh, megaphones, like uh, this making, lots of noise between the never explaining everything what was happening during the day. And it was the same. So it was superimposed somehow. Uh, they really had to use everything because it was very minimal, everything they had. So that's why I really pointed out that it's not only a celebration. Oh, this was fantastic because it's like a, also like a, a repairing a, that it was out of a scarcity, precariousness, a bad along with this very political optimism that things could be organized and, uh, in a different way. And there's also a lot of, uh, to learn uh, from the two cases here, where after the social outrage here in Chile, that was huge, and two years of pandemia, uh, returning in numbers in uh, two situations very similar to, to these years in terms of amount of encampments everywhere, uh, uh, the, the deficit numbers are almost equal or than in the 80s. Uh, so again, you have two ways of, <laughs> of reacting, uh, which is very important to, to review. So one, it's a very imposed, top-down, uh, controlled, uh, with no opinion. And the other one is actually realizing uh, the effects, the positive effects of involving and empowering people and actually in terms of in more practical terms uh, that we need them <laughs> to, to actually sort it out the situation. Thank you, thank you very much. I really enjoy Platon and Ahmed, the challenge of uh, I have presented the two things apart and I haven't realized uh, how connected they were. <laughs> I might have to write something now. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that is a really, I think this, this decade, right? Not just for Chile, I guess it's a very important moment for, for, uh, politics uh, in South America, but in other parts of the world as well. So there's a that crisis of, of, of uh, let's say, liberal democracy that, you know, um, erupts and becomes, a, you know, converts into dictatorial regimes. I mean, that's what happened in Portugal, that's what happened in, in Greece at the same time, right? So it's a, and around that, there's always this question of education and also space. I mean, it's, um, the Greek dictatorship did something similar, not with the stadium, but they basically increase uh, the, the allowable building uh, square meters per building by 30% across the, across Greece with one decree, basically three lines. They said, you could build three floors before, now you can do four floors. I mean, it's like a, these simple acts of, of, of uh, right-wing populism and this that you show us also these amazing posters, right? So, you know, now you become a proprietor, right? You become a, 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 a landowner, right? Which is really, really fascinating. Um, 
Any question from, from the audience? Last thing, Plat. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, uh, somehow stadium is a very complex project and I didn't go into the whole thing, uh, even mm -hmm. dwelling on the stadium uh, uses or the other policies that came along with the uh, delivery of uh, property titles, that there were many on the side. Uh, just recall me when you said about the, the fourth floor, but the very same year, the the urban limit was liberated, so everything could be called a city, but the state wouldn't follow <laughs> the city where, it, where actually the private sector wanted to arrive. Uh, so actually, the city sprawl was uh, insane uh, of only housing stock, but no public spaces, no schools, no hospitals, no all the rest uh, uh, of a place need to be called a city, uh, actually. And that's uh, the consequence of the social outrage even yesterday, uh, that you have like actors of city of only like a very precarious housing with no city on the side, let's say, <laughs> or with it. Uh, but also many other policies. There was eradication of all the um, taking of lands or encampments that were in inner land. It was cleaned outside uh, because the land was much more expensive. And today is 400 times the, the price of the moment that they were they were moved. So they were. It, it's the only. It's not the only one. It's like a, it really shaped. Uh, the way of understanding housing because there wasn't one policy it was like in tandem with all the two or three and only two years after uh, from the 17 communes uh, they divided them in 32 like twice as much but when they divided them uh, they followed the incumbents the taking of lands to make like uh, these bags of uh, homogeneity they declared it like that so we, we, we were we, they said that they would be able to serve them better if they were the same sort of population. But what they did was to make like uh, poor neighborhoods and richer neighborhoods. Uh, and it was a very tailored plan. That was the only plan that they really had <laughs> uh, to clean lands. And also that, they, of course, that you have one government that it's like the um, Salvador Allende and everything that that implies and then you have Pinochet and two policies and two ways of approaching the city very uh, radically opposite. I have one one question if I may ask which is about um, uh, other educational experiments in Chile at the same time in uh, other educational levels and if you can speak about them as well right? I mean we it is a very important of course legacy of uh, experiments in cybernetics from the same period from Chile experiments in uh, yeah, so we, we, really radical radical experimentation in multiple let's say fields mm -hmm. and if there are other uh, things that happen in, in the educational sector, in higher education, especially that are contemporary yeah. with the bus projects. We are so we run a studio on this uh, state agency called Sociedad Constructora de Establecimientos Educacionales uh, that ran in Chile for five decades, and it was very particular because it was pri public private, uh, not entirely from the state, not the private institution, and they had to, so they were in charge from everything, so from the choosing the lands where this school had to be, uh, the, this researching, designing, maintaining, uh, until it's a solution also during the dictatorship, that it was not, not only the dissolution of the, um, of this, of the, of this society, of, of construct, of, educational facilities construction, but also the solution of public education in Chile. So it was uh, hand by hand. And in those five years, uh, five decades, um, they, ha they, they have certain different periods that you can see, uh, and it's also related to the necessities of the country and the state of uh, wealth of the country. And we run a studio in the school, in the master program, 
that actually end up uh, one of the the, the basaula was one of the topic of one of the students that we developed and then end up with a, his essay published together. Uh, but many of the students took other moments, and you have this again the stamp plan that it was drawn uh, next to the plan of the bus in some of them. And of course, the next to the bus, it seems like the most um, simple and precarious and uh, like what Amy was saying, this regular classroom next to another one and a corridor, like nothing to add or nothing to, to be thought. But actually with that stamp plan, uh, they managed to arrive to the whole country. Uh, in a moment that the, the alphabetization was the priority, was as precarious as that, and they managed to to arrive, to, to arrive there and improve the numbers and, and arrive to the people because it was very easy to build. Uh, it was this uh, iron uh, structure <clears throat> and actually the window was the beam and then the, the, the material between the frames and the, uh, and the windows actually could be filled with anything that people in each sector had in, at hand. And it was meant to be built with the community. It was MC606, MC is Mediante Comunidad, that by means of the community. Uh, and they had to finish the schools. And they are not very fancy. <laughs> they are not changing the educational system, uh, but they manage with the typology, very simple, very clever, to arrive everywhere. And again, from north of Chile to the very south, uh, they find the the finishings actually was responding to each place, if you have bricks or if you have wood or if what you have at hand. And that's, again, not radical in terms of educational system, but radical in terms of uh, public thinking, uh, which I really like. <laughs> and what happened with them today? Because you can say that they are a heritage in many terms, like in architectural and material terms, but they had a role and they had a role that we can learn to re replicate uh, or even uh, they're still standing and they were supposed to be an emergency solution. That what happened with everything in Chile. Everything well, that was meant to be an, for emergency, actually it lasts till today. <laughs> uh, what do you do with them? Because there are many, like 4,000, I can't remember the exact number, but all along the country. So if you find a way to intervene, intervene them now, you have a project by 40,000 or something like that. Uh, and then we are with the research project uh, that started with the pandemia and we haven't been able to finish <laughs> all the things in pandemia. Uh, that was in another particular period because that's um, like an early middle stage, but there was uh, this moment in the, in the, perhaps in the middle of the five decades <clears throat> more to the lab to the end in which they perhaps they had solved, solved some of these uh, structural problems with the education in Chile and there was a decade in the in which they explore uh, different ways than the pavilion <clears throat> with the classroom as the rhetorical and material uh, building block of the school <clears throat> and we're studying five buildings all along the country in which they that unit was broke up. Um, <clears throat> they, they chose the square uh, as the building block, which is intriguing because you can you don't have hierarchy. Uh, they, you have more open space to organize a group in different ways. Uh, and it's many examples of Hertzberger and uh, and Van Eyck and so on. Uh, Jocelyn Good and uh, this square was also replicated into a field of squares, uh, actually like trying to emulate a piece of city through this uh, replication as a mud building or uh, and then again, uh, if the first period of this society um, built uh, schools uh, with this institutional phase with like the flag and a school with a nice clock and uh, this other period the architecture really seemed very raw, uh, like could be any social infrastructure from a hospital to a... Um, and we also tried to figure out what that meant for Chile uh, it has many international references uh, when you see them. Uh, but just after that, the society was truncated by the military regime. If that could have 
uh, had a different end, or if we could have, we could see today and see if we have to recover uh, some of that for the new times. In Chile, we are writing a new constitution uh, right now. Uh, and then again, it's a, a moment to recover or rethink what's going to be a role of the state, but also of architecture within that uh, for the future. Great. Thank you so much. Um, are there any questions from the audience? May, may I ask a, a self-interested question? Because I'm totally going to keep uh, uh, bugging uh, Alejandra on other purposes and just my, my current uh, question, because I'm trying to deal with um, education and adolescence. No, because it um, it has autonomy, which previous forms or stages of education don't have, but still don't have representation. No, and uh, actually, uh, I'm very curious because definitely, it's 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 where the the, the fiber no. It's where the current political generation driving change, or is trying to drive change, cut their teeth. You know, the secundaristas in, um, in Chile. So I was, I was asking just um, how was this related to the future of education? Now, I'm getting stuck in a lot of places where you ask about education, you get a lot of uh, uh, input when you ask about secondary education, as in an education that goes beyond alphabetization, that is geared towards some form of future, you, you run into a stumble, no? Because uh, the future requires permanence. And then it all, that's why I was asking, for instance, how, how would the Bazaula relate or relay with secondary education, for instance? Sorry, being self-serving. Thank you. No, <laughs> no thanks, Joaquin. Uh, actually, I'm not sure how to answer, so you will have to come to Chile and figure it out yourself with me, what happened with... Because my problem with the, the, the interest in the topic, um, I must admit that I'm not that interested in education itself as I am in the like architectural strategies that they managed to trigger. So in the case of the buses, they could be a, a health consultancy. <laughs> and they managed to uh, do the same. Or in the case of the plan, the stamp plan, uh, is the fact of arranging in your mind a typology that is so simple that actually could be end up by the community. Or um, so I must admit that I, I don't know that much. I had to read about the history of children education. I have to like uh, catch up with, uh, those topics um, and many of the theses that the students developed, I had to learn with them uh, about what they were interested. And that's my uh, relationship with the topic, like very specific topic. Uh, I would love to uh, explore further. Um, and sometimes I'm invited, as some people know that I have worked in the school, but I don't um, get to that level of... Um, of a specificity, even like some people ask me about their younger children or why why you never interested in the people <laughs> because in my pictures are and the research itself has hasn't gone there. But that's uh, amazing about other people that are interested in that part. Actually, how you can like uh, join effort together. Uh, uh, so I, I'm aware of your work on education tracking uh, and and. Yeah, you should come to Chile and help us to discover those. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Fantastic. <laughs> Great. Um, so we wrap it up here. Um, we would like to thank uh, Alejandra for joining us this uh, 
morning, this afternoon, depending where you are. <laughs> um, it was really, really great to have you. And I think that uh, we have the opportunity to talk about more about this work, which is really fascinating and, and uh, to the core of our interest here in the program as well. So take care. Um, and thank you, Ahmed. See you very soon. Yeah, thank you, Ahmed. Thank you, Platon. Uh, it's always great to be back at the AA. It would be better in person. Hopefully in Bedford Square soon. <laughs> yes, or, or back here. But back here. <laughs> with okay. the summer. Great. Thanks, Thanks everyone. All the Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye.